You may remain seated, but I invite you into our candle lighting liturgy as Celeste and I share the liturgy with you this morning. Because of war, because of violence in our communities, because there is still so much unrest in our hearts, we light a candle of peace. Because hatred is still so strong, because so many swords have not yet been made into plowshares, we light the candle of peace. May the light from this candle overwhelm the world. May the light from this candle say to all that God's peace is coming on earth as it already is in heaven. Friends, be not afraid. God's peace is at hand. Amen. I invite you now to stand as you're able in body and our spirit for our gathering hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. We'll be singing verses 1 and 2. So this is the season, season of Advent. Do you know what that means? What is it? Okay, that's all right. Advent is actually the start of the Christian New Year. So we actually celebrated our New Year a couple of weeks ago. Can you believe that? That's a little different, huh, than the, than the January the 1st. But it's when we, could we as Christians, um, start to anticipate the birth of Jesus that happens on what day? We celebrate that on December the 25th. And the word, who in here knows where the word Advent comes from? Yeah. 
The word is Adventus. It's a really old word, and it means the arrival of something or someone important. And it always starts on the fourth Sunday before Christmas, and it ends at midnight on Christmas Eve. And so as part of our Advent celebration and commemoration, we have different candles over there on the Advent wreath, and your mom helped me light one today. There are four candles. You can also see those displayed on the banners behind the choir. So last week we talked about hope. This week we're gonna talk about peace. And then next week we're gonna talk about joy. And then we're gonna talk about love. But if you notice, Ash, what, there's a candle right in the middle. What do you think that candle means? What do you think that candle represents? We light it on Christmas Eve. That is the Christ candle. And that's when we show by lighting that candle that Christ is the light of the world and that the light of the world has come on Christmas Eve. And that is when we um, celebrate on our Christmas Eve candlelight service that I hope you will be here for. And if you watch very carefully each week, this miniature stable that you see up here is going to have more and more things and more and more people in it as we get closer to Christmas Eve and even after. So keep your eye out for that. Let's pray. Holy God, thank you so much for this season of Advent, this new year in the Christian calendar and the excitement that comes as we prepare for Christ's birth. May the light of Advent be in all of us each and every day of this Advent season. We ask all this in the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you. Now is the time in our service where we give of our tithes and our offerings. I've already shared with you one of the ways that your financial support helps the work and ministry of this congregation, and there are a myriad of other ways. We have been given so much as people, and this is just our small way of being able to give back a portion of what we have been given. So I ask that as the choir sings this morning, that you will examine yourselves and let's give back with cheerful and grateful hearts.
now to join in our prayer of dedication. Holy One, this Advent season we wait in peace and we give in peace. A peace deeper than our anxiety and fear. A peace growing from our trust in your loving power. Receive these generous offerings and use them to bring peace to our world. Amen. After church, one Sunday morning, little Johnny tells his parents he has to go and talk to the pastor right away. So they agree, and the pastor greets the family. Little Johnny says, Pastor, I heard you say today that our bodies come from the dust. That's right, Johnny, I did, the pastor said. But well, Johnny says, and I heard you say that when we die, our bodies go back to dust. Is that right? And the pastor said, yes, Johnny, I'm glad you were listening. Why are you asking? And little Johnny says, well, you better come over to our house right away and look under my bed because there's someone either coming or going. <laughs> well, let's pray. Holy God, thank you so much for this beautiful Lord's Day. Thank you for allowing us to be here in this time, in this space, on this day, in this season of Advent. I'm thankful for each and every person that is here and for your light that shines so brightly through each and every one of them. And our smiles, our handshakes, our hugs, our prayers, our praise. And I ask that you be with us now as we break open and talk a little bit more about a portion of the Christmas story that's been handed down from generation to generation. And may the words of my mouth and may the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Have you ever found yourself afraid? Raise your hand if you have. All of us, if we're honest, at one point or another, have been afraid. And there are a lot of things in this world that I'm afraid of. I could rattle them off pretty quickly. Spiders are at the top of the list. Um, they terrify me. I would kiss a snake before I would touch a spider. <laughs> the dark, terrified of the dark. Um, and that's no secret to any of you. And I remember once when I was growing up on a farm in Alabama in the middle of nowhere where we didn't get Saturday Night Live until Monday. <laughs> and it's pitch black dark. And I had been playing out in the yard with the broom. Don't ask me why. It was Alabama. That's all I can say. And my mom needed the broom, and it was well after dark. And she said, you have to go outside and bring the broom in. So I went to the back door. I looked out. I saw how dark it was. And I said, oh, no. So I went back in, and she said, where's the broom? And I said, the broom is outside. I'm not going. It's dark. And she's responded, don't be afraid of the dark. God is out there. So I went to the back door and I screamed, God, will you please bring me the broom? <laughs> to which my mom pushed me out the door and locked the door until I went out and got the broom. And I have thought about that story a lot as I've been thinking about our message today being God meets us in our fears. And we don't talk a lot as adults about our fears. We like to keep our fears hidden. There are a lot of people that believe that fear is a weakness, and so they don't want to talk about it. I don't think fear necessarily is a weakness. I actually think that a healthy level of fear in certain circumstances is a good thing, and is a healthy thing. I think it is a natural thing to be afraid from time to time. I think sometimes fear is a motivator, at least it is for me. But we find in our passage today what is commonly referred to as the Annunciation. 
This is when the angel Gabriel comes to Mary and tells her that she is going to bear a child. So in our story, as I'm going to retell it to you today without looking at it from verse by verse, there are a few things that I want to point out. Mary is a very young lady at this time. Most scholars believe that she was anywhere, some go as early as 12, but anywhere from 14 to 16, 12 to 16, 14 to 18, a very young girl. When the angel Gabriel comes to her in a vision and says, Mary, you are the chosen one. You are the favored one. One. And this startles Mary, who wouldn't be startled by a celestial being coming to visit you at any age, but especially at such a young age as Mary. And so she's perplexed. She has questions. Who wouldn't? And in this story that's been handed down generation after generation after generation, the angel Gabriel obviously can sense that Mary is afraid. And in Luke's account that we're looking at this morning in Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38, Gabriel says to Mary, don't be afraid. Okay. I am a teenage girl being visited by a celestial being and your advice to me, Gabriel, is don't be afraid. No big deal. Mary was afraid. And who wouldn't be? She was engaged to be married to Joseph. We read briefly about Joseph last week when we talked about the genealogy that I read to you from Matthew that most of us skip over. And it said in there that Joseph was of the household of David. So Joseph was a descendant of David. And Mary is to be is engaged to be married to Joseph. And this is news to her that she is going to carry a baby. And she says, how can this be? I am a virgin. And Gabriel goes on to tell her, well, it's the Holy Spirit that is going to give you this child, and this child will be of the, king, of the lineage of David, and you, this child will be a leader among the people. Now, I can only imagine that Mary is continuing to formulate questions in her head about how this is even going to happen. Gabriel can probably sense some of that, and I have a suspicion that Mary talked about some of this to the angel Gabriel. And Gabriel says, well, and while I'm on the topic of things that are unusual, your cousin Elizabeth, who's been barren and is in old age, is also pregnant, six months pregnant, because there's nothing impossible with God. And I love in Luke's account, in this passage, when it immediately goes into the next verse, and Mary essentially says, let it be. If this is what has to happen, then let it be. That paints a beautiful picture, right? But this is kind of like the moon landing. When, who was the first guy on the moon? His name just left me. Neil Armstrong. Neil Armstrong. Supposedly stepped out and said, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. And I had a history um, teacher in high school that said he didn't say that at all. His first step, his first thought was, holy crap, I'm on the moon. <laughs> but that didn't get reported. I think there was a lot of dialogue here between Mary and the angel Gabriel that was not reported. I have a hard time believing that a teenage girl went immediately from, how can this be possible, to let it be. And I think it's important for us to stop just for a moment 
in this very important part of the Christmas story and realize that Mary was terrified. But God met Mary in her fear. Just like God meets you and I in our fear. Jesus, in his earthly ministry, knew fear. Jesus expressed fear and anxiety many times. Specifically, I'm thinking about when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane before his crucifixion. Jesus knew what fear was like, but Jesus also knew that God met him in his fear. And as much as I love the Christmas story and as much as I love all of the details around Mary and the fact that she was going to be with child, I can't help but stop and think about how scary that would have been. How scary this announcement would have been for her and how Mary needed peace. A peace that could come from no one else as a young girl finding herself soon to be with child and not just any child as the story is told. Maybe you, like Mary, need some peace. Maybe you are experiencing something in the midst of this busy holiday season where there's great music, and there's shopping and everybody's running around. There's beautiful decorations and there's Hallmark movies everywhere. And you may be looking at some of those Hallmark movies thinking, wow, I wish my life were like a Hallmark movie instead of like a horror movie. <laughs> and we all need peace. That's what this Advent season is all about. It's hope, as we talked about last week. And it's peace. Peace is coming. But while we wait and we anticipate the advent of peace that comes to us on Christmas Eve, let us not forget that God meets us in our fear. And God may not always bring us the broom, but God is always with us, even in our darkest and scariest moments. May that be a comfort to you and a comfort to me. Amen. I invite you now to stand as you are able in body and or spirit for our sermon and communion hymn. Come share the Lord. It's not in the hymnal, but the words are on the screen in front of you.